Integrity and Ethics in the Civil Service In order to understand this topic, it would be best to know the definition of the issues from the New Oxford Dictionary of English. There are four related words whose definition we should know, that is, ethics, integrity, honest and moral. The dictionary definitions are, ethics is moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conduct of an activity. Integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Honest is free of deceit and untruthfulness, sincere. Moral is concerned with the principles of right and wrong behavior. It can be noticed that none of these four words mention legal, lawful, according to rules, etc. All four relate to a person's own principles, his respect for truth and his own innate judgment of his own conduct which keeps him on the path of right behavior. He is expected to do this regardless of what the law says, out of his own conviction and free of the pressure of either his peers or his superiors watching him and then pulling him up for wrongful behavior. Ethics and integrity, therefore, have to come from within and cannot be superimposed. To help a person to behave ethically, we have laws, codes of conduct, systems of checks and a standard of what is acceptable to society. But these by themselves cannot create morality, uprightness, honesty or ethical behavior. That has to come from within the individual. A deeper understanding of meaning of ethics is provided by social thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau under the subject social contract. Is man by nature ethical or do circumstances make him ethical? Hobbes had a very poor opinion of the state of nature of man. According to Hobbes, unless there was a coercive power to ensure the basic security for political, social, civilized life, there would be no place for industry, no navigation, no arts, no letters. Instead, there would be continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. In other words, without strong government, there would be virtually the law of the jungle and life would be worthless. Rousseau, on the other hand, was a humanist. He recognized that man was no longer living in an absolute state of nature and therefore we do need civil society in order to create a social contract. This is how he puts it. The passage from the state of nature to the civil state produces a very remarkable change in man by substituting justice for instinct in his conduct and giving his actions the morality they had formerly lacked. Then only when the voice of duty takes the place of physical impulses and right of appetite does man, who so far had concerned only himself, find that he is forced to act on different principles and to consult his reason before listening to his inclination. In both, however, there is an underlying streak of similarity in that both recognize that orderliness in society is vital. By giving freedom of action and thought, they also prescribe the limits whereby the excise of one man's freedom does not impinge on the freedom of someone else. This, then, is the real social contract and in a democracy, this is the contract according to which the state must exist and its servants must function. In other words, together with ethics which guide the conduct of every civil servant, there is also the social contract which binds civil society and the officials are both the servants and functionaries. In an Indian context, the law and society in general recognizes following facts. 
an unrepentant and unreformed criminal cannot provide us with a crime-free society. We must have the magistracy and the police to ensure law and order, prevent, detect and prosecute crimes and to create an environment of security in which citizens can go about their lawful business peacefully. If a criminal cannot ensure law and order and freedom from crime and this duty devolves on the police. By definition, the police has to be a servant of the law and because most laws are based on sound moral principles, a policeman cannot afford to behave dishonestly, immorally, without integrity and ethics. Ethics and integrity, therefore, should be as natural to a policeman as is breathing. A democratic state is required to function justly and to ensure to its citizens good government, equal protection of laws, and to establish a social order which promotes their welfare. The preamble to our constitution states that the republic will provide social, economic, and political justice, the liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status. This implies that state and its functionaries will act with integrity and ethics because a dishonest or unethical state or civil servant cannot promote any of the basic principles laid down in the preamble. Article 14 mandates equality before law and equal protection of laws within the territory of India. This equality is not restricted to Indian citizens only and would be enjoyed by every single person residing within the territory of India. How can an unethical state functionary ensure equality? Article 38 of the Constitution requires the state to secure a social order for the promotion of welfare of the people. Immoral behavior by public servants will invariably be inimical or against to the welfare of the people. And, therefore, Article 38 makes it mandatory for public servants to behave ethically. Therefore, it is quite clear that even our Constitution demands that there has to be ethical behavior and total integrity on the part of public servants. The scheme of government in India is that the Constitution provides for separation of the three constituents of the Indian state, that is, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. These organs do not operate in a vacuum or in watertight compartments and obviously there is interaction at different levels. The organ of the state which interacts on a day-to-day -day basis with the citizens is the executive. There is the president in whom all executive powers vest, but he is required to exercise this power through officers subordinate to him and in exercising these powers, he is constitutionally required to go by the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. The Council of Ministers consists of members of Parliament appointed by the President on the advice of the Prime Minister and constitutionally the Council is collectively responsible to the House of the People. India, being a representative democracy, Parliament represents all the people of India and because the Council of Ministers is accountable to the House of the People, its members are, through Parliament, accountable to all the citizens of India. In other words, the ministers, too, are bound to respect the social contract in which civil society appoints them, and they, in turn, serve the civil society with integrity. The civil servants who help the President to exercise executive power on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers are also expected to adhere to the same code of ethics and of integrity as would be applicable to ministers. Article 14 of the Constitution specifically prohibits civil servants from denying equality to any citizen and therefore, in implementation of policy, the civil servant is required to be totally fair and without prejudice. He will be guided by the policy, by the law, by the rules and by his much higher accountability to the principles of integrity and ethical behavior. In the present political circumstances, however, 
there are all kinds of pressures put on civil servants to do things which a politician feels would be beneficial to him, even though it is ethically wrong and legally untenable. There is a tendency of politicians to subvert the state in order to get the money to buy and retain power and, for this purpose, they attempt to tame the civil servants first into submission. Civil servants who resist this are sidetracked, browbeaten, humiliated and worse and it becomes difficult for them to resist or to follow a higher code of ethics. Many civil servants have succumbed and there are several who have both become willing partners and the instigators of corrupt practices which would benefit both the politician and the civil servant. This is in an unenviable situation for civil servants who are under pressure to do things which are neither honest nor ethical. Politicians have been blamed for not listening to either to the voice of reason or to the voice of morality. Does that release civil servants from their bounden duty to follow the principles of integrity and ethics? But constitution provided basic protection for administrators. As said before, articles 53 and 154 vest the executive power of the union and the states in the president and the governor respectively because the power is required to be exercised by the officers subordinate to the president or the governor and because these officers together constitute the civil service. The executive is divided into two equal parts. The first consists of the council of ministers who are elected members of the legislature and on whose aid and advice the president or governor would be required to take executive decisions. This part of the executive, the council of ministers, would be the elected executive. Because the elected executive is required to function through civil servants, the civil service would be the permanent part of the executive. This part of the executive does not exist at the mercy of the political executive. Part 14 of the Constitution provides for the civil services, including recruitment through Public Service Commission. It guarantees against arbitrariness under Article 311 and the very special provisions under Article 312 for all India services appointed by the President. The permanent part of the executive, therefore, has an independent existence under constitutional guarantee and therefore, the civil service is not permitted to quote the orders of superiors as an excuse for wrongdoing. This principle is actually enshrined in our constitution because it is said it is the only constitution in the world which provides this kind of protection to the civil service. No other constitution has the equivalent of Article 311 which provides almost total immunity against arbitrary behavior of the political executive. The civil services in India can never be forgiven for unethical behavior or for deviation from integrity because the constitutional guarantees and presupposes that they will be honest. If they are not, they cannot expect